Amen. Thank you, Marlon. Thank you, Angie, and all that team, and all those volunteers that help us to carry out, uh, whether it's putting in 31 sensory perception rooms or feeding all of these teachers that we go out and feed and we try to honor. Would you give all of those that volunteer a nice round of applause this morning? Marlon, thank y'all uh, for everything that you do. You know, when we do things like that, it, uh, it gives Jesus a good name, and that's what uh, we want to be able to do. There's a purpose and why we do what we call ministry with no strings attached. In other words, we're going out there, we're doing things not so that we can use a facility, not so that we can necessarily go in and, uh, you know, get things accomplished that we want to accomplish. We go in and say, how in the world can we serve you? Where's a need that we we can help to be able to meet. And the sensory perception rooms are absolutely uh, one of the very best things that we can do. And when we go out and we do those kinds of things, you know, eventually people ask us, whether it's the people who go out and serve in those concession stands because we're getting ready for Friday night football to kick up here in several weeks. And when that gets started, we're going to have volunteers out doing those kinds of things. And inevitably, people People say, now, why in the world are y'all coming and doing this? And sometimes people actually think our volunteers are getting paid, and um, our volunteers explain to them, we're not getting paid at all. We're here so that you can go see, you know, your daughter in the band or your son or the cheerleader or the football player, uh, whatever sport it is, and that's why we're here is to be able to help you to be able to experience life and to be able to do it in a wonderful way. And so we go there and we invest. And eventually people always say, so why do you do this? And we're able to share with people, well, uh, people matter to God, so people matter to us. And that's why we do the type of ministry that we do. And it's in those kinds of settings often that uh, we get to give an invitation to someone, you know, to come and to visit our church. And today I'm going to take you the book of John, and we're going to be in John chapter 1. And let me tell you about the book of John. It is absolutely chock full of invitations. I'm going to show you several of them. And the invitations usually are around the idea of being able to become a follower of Jesus Christ and to be able to experience his power uh, in your life. And so when these invitations were given to some of these people, they had no earthly idea what really stood in the balance. And I think the same thing is true for our lives as well, that sometimes we receive invitations and we really do not even fully comprehend what that invitation uh, is going to lead to. I want you to think about in your own life, what is an invitation? What are some invitations you've had uh, to be able to go and to experience some things? And so when I was thinking about this and Gavin Adams did a great job of helping us to craft this message today, I started thinking about about some of the neat invitations that I've had in my life. Um, I've been able to go, I got an invitation on two different occasions to go and attend the State of the Union Address, which is absolutely a surreal feeling to be inside of that chamber and to realize you're the only person in there that everyone doesn't know who you are, and uh, to be in that kind of a setting. Uh, back during, uh, before the 96 Olympics, when it Atlanta got the invitation uh, to host the 96 Olympics. I was fortunate to get an invitation to go to the White House and to be there with a group that, you know, basically helped Atlanta to get uh, that invite to host the Olympics and got to go to the Rose Garden. And the whole time, Robin complained because there were no roses in the Rose Garden as, as we were seeing them. But think about the different invitations that you've received in in your life. And those invitations and those opportunities maybe were really remarkable. And you know, you go there and you have an experience that, <clears throat> forgive me, is absolutely amazing. But how do you go back 
and how do you communicate that? Uh, how do you go back and say, you know, th this is what this experience is like? And sometimes there are just certain things that when you try to tell people about the experience that you've had, it it's hard for you to explain it. And it it's the kind of thing where you say, well, you know, you, you just have to be there. And so think now, not just about an invitation you've had, but what about an experience that you've had? You know, an experience you would say, man, I would love to be able to take you uh, to see what this place is like. Maybe you've traveled somewhere. Uh, if you've been around me very long, you know that I'm a huge fan of Hawaii and in particular, the island of Maui. And I love Kauai, I love the Big Island, I love Oahu, uh, Malakai, I love all of those different islands, Lanai that are there, but Maui is my favorite. And if any of you are ever taking a trip over and you're trying to figure out which restaurants to eat in, start with Mama's Fish House, best restaurant in the world, absolutely incredible, just call me and I'll send you my list because I have a list on my iPad of here's what you need to do when you go to Maui because the experience is just absolutely amazing. All the beauty in the world, no humidity. Think about that when you're in Atlanta in the summer in the month of July, what it would be like to be around 82 to 84 degrees and it's just wonderful. And if you said, well, Ike, I'm going to go on this trip with you. What's an experience that you would tell me I'll never forget? I would say, well, there's probably two or three. One of them is the road to Hana you will never forget because you'll be horrified most of the time when you're on the road to Hana. But I'd tell you, man, it is well worth it. But I'd also say, I want to take you up to the top of Haleakala. That's the volcano. Maui is basically two vo volcano sides to the island. And uh, you have West Maui, which has the West Maui cliffs. But if you go Go over to the east side, there's Haleakala. And if you would be willing to get up at about 3 o'clock in the morning, I would put you in the car, and we'd drive up to the top of Haleakala, and we'd watch the sun rise. And it's one of the most spectacular views you can ever have to be up there on the top of Haleakala. Or if you're not a morning person and you say, I also want a great experience, I'd say, well, then we need to go to the top of Haleakala at night. And in particular, if we can get an astronomer, which I've done before, and we could be there during the Per Se meteor shower, which is this time of year that we're in right now, you'll go up to the top of that volcano, and the stars are so thick thick that you can't even imagine it. You sit there and you look at the Milky Way and it looks like a piece of gauze hanging up there. That's how thick the stars are. And the first time that uh, I went up there with an astronomer, we're standing on the top of this volcano. We're up there at the top and I'm looking at these lights that are down at about this level right here and I'm looking kind of downward and I thought they were like lights at the airport or something and so I asked the astronomer, I said, well, what are those lights that are right down there at the bottom of the horizon? He said, I, they're stars. See, we're used to seeing stars and kind of here with light diffusion. We can see them about pretty much at that level. And then the astronomer who was a Christian quoted scripture to me. He quoted the book of Job. He said, he hangs the earth upon nothing. And when you're up there, you're seeing it looks like stars that are falling down into the ocean. And then you've got the shooting stars. They're going everywhere. And that was such an incredible experience. And my daughters, who were teenagers at the time, pitched the biggest fit you've ever seen in your life. Why in the world are we going to go freeze to death on top of a volcano when we could be having fun down in Lahaina and all of this. But you ask them today, and they would tell you one of the most incredible experiences they've ever had in their life. What an incredible experience. What are some of the ones that you've had? Uh, we swam with dolphins, and it was 10,000 feet of water. We were on a tour boat that had been snorkeling, and we asked the captain when all of a sudden there was this pot of spinner dolphins, can, can we jump in the water and swim with them? And he looked at us and went, have at it. And we jumped in, and we suddenly realized the other 50 people were watching our family. 
the idiot family who had dove into 10,000 feet of water to swim with those dolphins. I, I could never tell you in enough words what it was like. Those spinner dolphins would dive and they would come down into the water and they would come up and they would look right into your face mask. And I mean, it was just the most amazing thing. And if I took you to Israel, well, I'd take you to several different places there. I would take you to the church of the nativity in Bethlehem, and you would be amazed to go in and to be in that facility that was built in the 300s, believe it or not. Or I would take you over to the tomb and uh, the empty tomb in the garden, and I would let you see that. And there's so many places I would take you. I'd take you to the Sea of Galilee. I mean, it would be incredible. And then when we got Got ready for some fun and just kick back, I'd say, okay, I'm going to take you to the coolest shop you've ever been in in your life. And it's Sinwali uh, Jewelry Shop Textiles. My buddy Omar there is the proprietor along with his brothers. And we always take a group to go and see Omar at, at his shop. It's in the old city of Jerusalem. There's Omar and I just hanging out together. Over to Omar's right. Now, I want you to think about this. Omar is sitting there. His family, are you ready? have owned this building for 388 years. 388 years his family has been there. Over to his right, there's a well that you can look down, and you're looking down. It's the oldest, deepest well in Jerusalem, and you look right down into the water system. And this is in the old city of Jerusalem. And man, when you go there, he has artifacts that go back for centuries. He's an authentic merchandiser of Middle Eastern items, and the shop is just incredible. It's an invitation to hospitality when you go there. Let's see some of the, the other pictures that are there. There's Robin. Omar loves Robin, and Robin really loves Omar. I, I'm telling you, I don't know if y'all know, but uh, the name Robin in Cherokee means she, she was born to shop. And so this is Robin's place. And so we go down in the old city, and there you see some of the rest of our team. And uh, this is one of the spice shops that's right next door. Let's keep going. And uh, this, it's like Alibaba's treasure chest. I, I mean, it really is. When you go there, you just have a great time. Keep going for me, guys. Uh, just every corner of the shop, it's multiple rooms that uh, you're going through, and you're seeing stuff. And then this last time, Omar says, hey, you guys need to come over with a mom, my brother, and, and uh, Mahmoud, and uh, come over, and we're going to do lunch for you guys. And so they had this huge setup. This is just one place where we were sitting there eating, and, and they do this for you because they are built around hospitality. That's what they love to do. And so when you go with me to Israel one day, I promise you we're going to go to Omar's shop, and the only thing in the world that I can possibly think of that would help you to understand what this shop is like is the next slide right here. Now, that's our group. Sorry. You, you can see all of us having a, a really great time right there. Uh, that, that's also a special moment. But this is the slide that I think you'll really understand right here. How many of us, you know, the Krispy Kreme donut hot light, right? All of a sudden, we know that we're in for a really great day when we see that pop up. Now, how many of you know what it's like to bite into not just a Krispy Kreme donut, but a hot Krispy Kreme donut? Can I see here? Is it not a religious experience? I mean, it truly is. There is something about it. I was going to buy everyone a Krispy Kreme donut today, but Roger told me I couldn't. So as the executive pastor, he has that right. But you know, it melts in your mouth. And I think God created this so that we could experience what heaven is like on earth. And God also gave us kale so we know what hell is like. So, you know, we, we, we got both things when it comes, you know, to, to our taste buds, right? So there's some things, whether it's Hawaii 
or whether it's Israel, or whether it's Krispy Kreme, or whether it's going to Senegali, uh, to their jewelry shop, uh, there's some things that you've just got to be able to experience. Now, the same thing is true biblically when we talk about Jesus, because you have to experience Jesus. And what's the best atmosphere? What's the best way to be able to put things together so that when people come here to Piedmont Church, that they come in and they fully experience the Lord? And so one of the ways that we can learn is we go to Scripture and we see how in the book of John that we're taught about the way that Jesus introduces people to himself and to the experience of becoming what we would call a born-again believer. And so we always go to the Gospel of John. And if someone came to me and said, hey, Ike, I'm a brand new Christian. I want to start reading my Bible. Or maybe if they're not a Christian and they go, I want to read a book in the Bible, which book would you tell me to read? I would always tell them to start with the Gospel of John because it's one of the four books in the New Testament that tells the story of Jesus Christ. And it's written by John, one of Jesus' disciples, but it presents a very unique perspective on the life of and the teachings of Jesus. Because the book of John is going to emphasize the divinity of Jesus. It's going to present him as the Son of God. It will present him as the source of eternal life. And it includes so many of Jesus' teachings, his miracles, as well as his interactions with, with various people, including Nicodemus that we studied about a few weeks ago, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, about Martha and Mary and their experience with him, and when their bro brother Lazarus died, how Jesus raised him from the dead, but also that John's gospel emphasizes the importance of belief in Jesus as the key to being able to experience eternal life and to be able to know what salvation is all about. So John records many of Jesus' claims about himself, and we're going to take a look at some of those right now. So I'm going to go to the book of John. Let me do this real quick. Book of John chapter 1, and I'm going to begin in verse number 35. It says, again the next day, John is standing with two of his disciples. So this is John the Baptist. He's down at the Jordan River, right there on the border uh, with the nation of Jordan, right there at Syria, where they kind of join up. He's there in that part of the Jordan, and he's been baptizing people. And so John has had a ministry that's been going on. Jesus hasn't gone public with his ministry yet, and John has some disciples. And two of them were standing with John, and he looked up, and he saw Jesus. And it says, as Jesus walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And then Jesus turns here in the story, and he saw them following, and he said, what do you seek? What is it that you're looking for? Now, I don't know what these two disciples were really looking for that day, but the closest thing they could say to him is they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? I mean, you know, where is home for you? Where are you staying right now? And then Jesus gives them an invitation. Now, John the Baptist's invitation was just kind of a blanket statement. Behold the Lamb of God. And you say, but now how, how is that an invitation? Because here's what John knew. Everyone was looking for the Lamb of God. Everyone was looking for the Messiah. People wanted to be able to experience this Christ that had been prophesied in the Old Testament. And when John says, behold the Lamb of God, that was a huge statement for these two disciples. And so then they start following after Jesus, and he says, what is it that you're seeking? And they said, Rabbi, which translates teacher, where are you saying? Here comes the invitation. He said to them, come and you will see. I want you to come 
and to see. We want people to come and see what we do here at Piedmont Church, how we want to love on people, how we want to make a difference in their life, and I want that hospitality level to be like the level that I talked to you about with Omar and his brothers. That when you walk through the door, that there is just a sense that there is something different. As a matter of fact, this even before you walk through the door. It's the way that you invite people to church. It's the way that you give invitations to maybe your family members, or maybe it's your next door neighbors, or maybe it's your coworkers, or maybe you're even a little more bold with your faith. Maybe you uh, invite, uh, you know, like your waitress or your waiter at a restaurant. And if you're going to invite them to this church, please make sure that you tip appropriately, that if you invite someone that actually want to go to your church, because nobody wants to go to the church of a cheapskate, all right? I, I just guarantee you that. So make sure you're doing those, those right things. And then from the time they drive in the parking lot to the time they leave the parking lot, we want it to be the greatest experience in the world for people. I mean, we want it to be absolutely amazing for people. So Jesus gives them the invitation, come and you will see. So they came and they saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. And one of the two who heard John speak and followed him, now we know who those two disciples are, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So now then, Andrew has been brought into this experience with Jesus. What does he do? Verse 41, he found first his own brother Simon, and he said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means we found the Christ. And so the first place that Andrew started was the person who was the closest to him, and that was his brother. He wanted his brother to know that he had found the Messiah. And so he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You're going to be called Cephas, which translated means Peter. Now the next day, the Bible tells us, Jesus purposed to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the, the city of Andrew and Philip. And then Philip found Nathanael, and he said to him, we found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He was saying, we found the Messiah. And Nathanael says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, our Nathaniel, Nathaniel, are we good? So, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And so look at the answer. It's another invitation. Philip said, come and see. When you invite your friends, when you invite your family to come to this church, what do you want them to see? What do you want them to be able to experience? And so in, in John 1, there there's that invitation. And the invitations are all the way through the Scripture. And in the book of John, we're being introduced to Jesus. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. In John chapter 11, verse 25, the reason I love the Gospel of John, my favorite passage and my favorite couple of verses in the New Testament are in John chapter 11, and it's the story of when he's raised Lazarus from the dead. And, and when he raises him from the dead, he makes you and I this promise. He says, I am the resurrection, and I'm the life. And the one who believes in me will live even if he dies. And so Jesus answers that age-old question from the book of Job. If a man dies, is he going to live again? And according to Jesus, he's saying, I am the resurrection, I am the life, and the one who believes in me will live even though they may 
physically die. He's saying spiritually, you and I are going to be remarkably alive. And in John, the other I am statements made by Jesus, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 6, verse 35. In John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. In John 15, 5, I'm the vine and you're the branches. And probably then the most famous verse in all of the Bible is in John. We talked about it recently when we talked about Nicodemus. And that's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but they can have everlasting life. So overall, the gospel of John presents Jesus as the son of God. He is the source of eternal life. He is the key to salvation, and it emphasizes the importance of belief in Jesus and the need to follow him as Lord and Savior. And so in this Gospel of John, we're given those invitations. And we're taught how powerful the invitation is and why it should be such an important thing to each one of our lives to invite people to come and see. But after they come and see, here's the next part that's the hinge, then we need to go and do. That's why we do love does. That's why we love the verse that's Ephesians chapter 2 uh, verse uh, 10 where it says that we are created in Christ Jesus as his workmanship so that we can go out and do good work so that not people will look at us not people will look at Piedmont Church but that people will look at Jesus and glorify him. That's why we go out and we do the work that we do. And so the invitation is there. And the invitation for all of us today is that we need to show people how much Jesus loves them and that he first loved us, and then listen carefully, and then we create conditions that, that are conductive to be able to help people experience Jesus. And, you know, that's the, that's the chain that happens. Somebody invited you. Maybe you had an invitation that uh, is one of those invitations that you couldn't refuse. Your parents told you you were going to go to church. And so you end up coming to know the Lord while you're there. It's just important that we all do our part to invite people. And then when they get here, listen to me, when they get here, then we've got to make absolutely sure that we're doing everything in our power to be able to make the experience for them something that's just absolutely remarkable. And that's why we need you in the nursery. That's why Savannah needs you with the preschoolers. That's, that's why Jennifer needs you in the children's ministry that goes on here. That's why Jake needs you uh, to be able to help him. Is Jake in this service? Are Jake and Grace in here? Right over here. Jake and Grace, kind of wave your hand a little bit. They got engaged this weekend. Isn't that great? Yay. Congratulations, guys. I hope you were ready to go public with that since I just, okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, great to ask now, right? I always get forgiveness rather than permission. That was a genius move on my part. But Jake needs you working in middle school. Isaac needs you working with high school and college all the way through. I can tell you Donna needs you on the hospitality team and, and to serve, you know, in other areas. We have people work security here. We have Angie that helps to head up the medical team. We, we have everything. We try to think of every way that when people... People come here, they feel secure, and they know that this is a place where they're going to be loved. And so Gavin calls it, Gavin Adams calls it, from parking lot to parking lot. How do we create the atmosphere that when people come here, it's like going to Omar's place, and you feel like your family and you feel like people genuinely have hospitality and they're at the doors and they're smiling and, and they're meeting people. Uh, you know one of the problems that we sometimes have at Piedmont? We get along so well with each other, sometimes we forget to get 
to stop getting along with each other and focus on all these new people that are coming through the doors. And we have the opportunity to meet so many of them. In the early service this morning, I met several new families who are brand new coming through the doors here to Piedmont Church. And so we want to be ready. And the reason we want to be ready is because we're three years now through a pandemic. We've gone three years in that pandemic. Hard to believe. We would have, I would have never dreamed on March the 13th, 2020, that the pandemic would have gone on so long. And we watched churches, a lot of churches closed their doors because they, you know, their numbers just dwindled. But, you know, we, we redeployed. Uh, we turned that great hall into a warehouse and we were feeding about 800 people a week here while that was going on, not to mention all the other things that we were doing. And we were very fortunate to be in that position. Uh, you know, 14 years ago, we started doing live streaming. So we weren't having to scramble and try to buy equipment and do live streaming. We just kept right on going. And folks, I want you to know what a miracle this is. I'm bragging on you. During the three years of pandemic, we set records each year with our giving. The best years in the history of this church were during the pandemic. That is miraculous. Now we're on the other side. Now people are beginning to think about coming back to church. However, there was a major study that came out last week. You're going to love this. I couldn't make this up. They asked the question among people who go to church. Now, these are church people. What is the number one reason you do not go to church on a Sunday? You know what it was? Bad weather. Number one reason. Number two reason you do not go to church on Sundays. Good weather. I promise you, I'm not making that up. I'm not trying to be funny or cute, though I'm both. I mean, you know, that's not, I'm not trying to be funny. Number one reason we don't go to church, bad weather. Bad weather keeps us from going. Number two reason we don't go, good weather. Doesn't that pretty much cover everything? I mean, when you get right down to it. And then they went for all the other reasons. Uh, some people, it was because they got used to staying home and watching live streaming. And see, I still think that you can't replicate at home what goes on inside this building. You know, God said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. There is something about being inside this building and, and you know, just uh, having that experience. Now, I'm going to get to have an experience. This is deeply spiritual, so y'all bear with me. Uh, on November the 4th, I'm going to get to go hang out with a bunch of great hymn writers. Uh, it's called the Eagles Farewell Tour. And uh, I got an invitation from my buddy, Hal Blackman, to come uh, along with his wife, Rosa, and, and to go to the Eagles concert on, on that night at State Farm Arena. And man, I'm excited about going. I know it's, it's going to be a fantastic night. We're going out to eat. I mean, everything's been lined up. It's going to be great. There's that level of excitement and anticipation I have. We should have, when people walk in here, I want that same level of expectation and anticipation. You say, you, you mean for the people who are coming here to visit? No, from you. Do you realize when someone accepts Jesus that the angels in heaven rejoice and that we get to be a part of that? And if we have a sense of excitement, if we have a sense of anticipation that it's not the same old, same old, but that something amazing can happen. You don't think it's amazing? Let one of your grandchildren get saved. And then you get to be up there in the water when they're getting baptized. You see your son or your daughter with them. Uh, we've got things coming. We've been meeting with architects. Uh, we've been meeting uh, with event uh, space planners uh, because that building out there that Grace Point's been in for the last seven years or so comes back to Piedmont at the end of December. Uh, that's going to become a major feature in the future. There are other things that we're going to be doing out in that space where the core Courtyard is, and we're getting ready to embark on another major drive to see more and more people come into the life of this church. It is too late to prepare when they're already coming. 
You need to start ahead of time. You, you need to be gearing up for what's going to happen. And you're our core. The reason we're doing the I-series is what can I do to influence? What can I do next week to impact? And I'm going to talk to you about being a part of the body of Christ next week. And then the next Sunday is when we know a lot of people are going to be back in church. There's going to be a lot of families that have moved into our area, and they're going to be coming into this church. That's why Donna and her team on hospitality, we've got a new area out there that's guest services out there in the Great Hall over to the right. And uh, you notice we did the summer pop-up shop that had the shirts and the hats and all of that kind of stuff. That's because we want you wearing that because somebody's going to look at you and go, do you go to that church? You know, can I go there? and attend and you you never know who's going to show up recently we did our must gala and that night I, I have a new jumpsuit an elvis jumpsuit and so i was dressed up as elvis that night of the gala and the next morning was a sunday and a couple came here to visit and had they, they went to the gala the night before, and when I walked out, the lady went, good Lord, it's Elvis. And they were stunned to know the same guy who was dressed up like Elvis the night before was, you know, here at church the next morning. Well, they were back this morning, and I was talking with them. Turns out they are cousins of Libby Longacre. They had no idea that that connection was there. When you invite people and you get to know people, and I was talking to them after the first service, and then, uh, Donna, the lady, said that she's from Kentucky. Well, you need to meet Marlon and Libby. They're from Kentucky. They were a little town called Fairdale that they're from. And then there's that connection. That's why those of you who have a great personality, you need to be serving on this hospitality team. You need to be at those doors. You never know when someone is walking through those doors and they've gotten a terrible health diagnosis, they've gotten all kinds of situations they've had to deal with, and they're coming through those doors, and we need to be here with a sense of expectation and anticipation, and I need you in that role. I need you serving in that type of a way. So this morning, you see that we have the table that's here in front of us. And this morning, we're going to be celebrating together one of two ordinances the Lord has given us, and baptism being one, and we're going to baptize here in a couple of weeks, but it's the Lord's Supper this morning that we're going to celebrate together. And by the way, the last time we baptized, we baptized 19 people. When we went to Israel, we baptized, I think it was 36 people while we were in Israel. We've seen God doing some amazing stuff in the life of our church. Now, when you come down, I'm going to read you some verses, and you get ready to partake. Uh, you just take the wafer, and you dip it into the cup once. No double dipping, right? So you just dip it in there. But here's what I'm asking you to do as your pastor. I'm asking you that when you come down today, and you get ready to partake of the Lord's Supper, and you pick up the elements, would you ask him, what do you want me to do in the life of this church? How do you want me to invest my time? How do you want me to invest my talent? How do you want me to invest my treasure? How do you want me to invest my touch in the life of this church? Because this is an invitation that's in front of you. Paul said, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after the supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. You do this. For as often as you drink it, you do it in remembrance of me. And then he combines the bread and the cup. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. That means until Jesus Christ comes back. The first advent was in Bethlehem. The second advent is going to be, according to Scripture, 
when Jesus comes back in the sky at the Mount of Olives, and there's going to be a massive earthquake that's going to split the mountain in two. And it's called the rapture. That's the second advent. So he gives us some wisdom. Paul does. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. This is a diagnostic feast. And in doing so, he's to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks and eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge his body rightly. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we will not be judged. But when we are judged, we're disciplined by the Lord so that we'll not be condemned along with the world. So they're going to come out, take all of this stuff off the stage. They're going to sing a couple of worship songs. As we get to participate in an age-old invitation. See, when I talk about experiences, when we were in Jerusalem for my wife Robin, it wasn't in the jewelry store, although that was pretty fascinating for her. It was at the site that tradition says is the upper room, where the first Lord's Supper was presented after the Passover. Jesus said, I'm going to institute something new. Robin will tell you it was in that spot that she felt the closest connection when she visited Israel. That was a supper too that was an invitation that Christ gave. And I'm inviting you on his behalf today to come to this supper. It's a holy time. It's a sacred time. They're going to be staff, there's going to be staff and there's going to be elders and there's going to be other leaders in our church that are going to come to each row and tell you when to come down. Also those of you in the balcony. And now we're going to celebrate together a meal that is 2,000 years old. An invitation was given by Jesus himself to come to his table. So, Father, bless the bread, bless the cup that represents the blood as we come to the table in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.